reciprocal to our pulpit this morning. She's the associate pastor of Grace Methodist Church. And I know we have several people with announcements this morning in addition to what's already in your bulletin. There's just something I want to call attention to. And one of them is there is an evangelism committee, committee meeting today in the fireside room immediately following our service. And there's also a meeting of the volunteers for the um, Bible school. They'll be meeting in the parlor immediately following our service. And now anybody, I know there's others, a couple others that have some announcements. I'm not good yellers. I have three. I'll make it really snappy. One is also about Vacation Bible School. It starts tomorrow, so if you know any kids, please invite them Monday through Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. We're transforming the upstairs into an um, airport terminal because we're going around with the world with Jesus as our tour guide. So invite kids. Um, the second is that uh, Jim Crawford will be getting will be beginning a um, Bible study or Sunday school, not next week, but the following week, which is the 16th at 9 o'clock, and it's going to be about prayer. There's no homework, he said, but he'll have lots of handouts. I think it'll be really interesting, so while we're on summer break, don't take a break from prayer and, and the like. It'll be um, upstairs in the um, conference room. Thank you for asking that, Lauren. And finally, um, there's a sign-up sheet right outside on the table for accolades. We've always had kids acolyte, but it doesn't have to be kids. So if you'd like to be involved in worship, but you don't want to be up front all the time, <laughs> um, it's an opportunity to carry the light of Christ. So if you'd like to acolyte sometime this summer, the sign up sheet's out there. And thank you. I know we still, Chuckwood tell us that we still need some special music, I think, in July and August. So if you want to, you can see him too. <coughs> Uh, there's, I think, a sign-up sheet outside his office if you want to sign up for that. And Sally? Yes, this coming Thursday, June 6th, is our turn to host the community dinner that starts at 5.30. We ask people to come at 3.30 to help, and we'll ask um, that you bring fresh fruit. Fit those two big stainless steel bowls of fresh fruit, and it is gone. <laughs> People love the fresh fruit. Uh, also, the last two times, we have taken some hot meals to some of our members. We call them and they have been thrown, have a meal delivered. So that's something new we're trying. <laughs> Anybody else have an announcement? As a call to worship, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, the God who is and who was and who is to come. Let us give thanks for all that was. Let us celebrate all that is. Let us imagine all that will be. Let us worship God with a gathering of prayer. Living God, you sent Jesus, the bread of heaven, to be our food for eternal life. Nourish us with your word and fill us with your spirit, so that we may believe and have life through Christ, the Holy One of God.
prayer of confession. Say with me, please. Merciful, Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your way. You call us to love and serve you, yet we choose false and empty idols. You call us to new life in Christ, yet we turn aside and fall back in fear. <coughs> Forgive us. And then Sunday, there was a really good football game on. So he decided, you know what? 
I don't have to be at church every Sunday, so we take that part off of Bob, too. So now Bob's not going and worshiping with his friends. And, you know, sometimes life just gets really busy, and Bob doesn't have any time to study his Bible, so we're going to take some more of God's protection off Bob. And, you know, sometimes things happen where Bob's really psyched because something went really well, and, and he's, like, really proud of himself, and he takes all the credit for the things that went right, when we really know a lot of times God does that. So we're going to take that part off of Bob, too. And, you know, sometimes in his busyness, Bob just totally forgets that God's part of the picture. He thinks he's doing it all himself, and he's all on his own, and he feels really important. So we take that part off. So we got the rest of Bob left, right? What do you think happens when you don't have God's protection in life? Think it goes well? You think Bob can still swim? No. Bob sank. And I don't care how deep your bowl is, they will sink without the skins on. Because see, in life, God wants us to be with him and, and have a relationship with him. So that means a time of prayer, that means a time of coming to church, that means reading your Bible. If you want to be able to survive the hard stuff in life, you need God's protection in your life. And it means you need to have a relationship with him. Does that make sense? All right, let's pray real quick before he gets to the back. <laughs> God, sometimes orange peels are disgusting but they protect the orange. And sometimes the things that you want from us may not seem as fun as the things the world offers, but you do it to protect us because you love us and you want to be with us. So remind us that we need to spend time praying, worshiping, reading your word, and just being with you because you're the one who's going to look out for us and help us through all the hard times. May each one of these amazing kids grow up to be the men and women you've created them to be. And may you continue to protect them on their journey. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hmm? No, Pastor Christy. I'm from Grace. I'm the one who comes for a prize day. Yeah, you're not used to seeing me with makeup on. I get it. I'll try to do this without spring. We'll be ready. <laughs> I should ask my church sometime about the elephant toothpaste experiment I did in church. It was next year. <laughs>
hearts to accept your word, silencing us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand and stand your ground. And even after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the, all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray, pray in the spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When Karen reached out to me and asked me if I would come share a message with you today, I was excited because I haven't gotten to come worship here except for special occasions. Um, and it was funny because this was actually my Sunday to preach at Grace, so I had to call Keith and say, guess what, you got to work now. <laughs> He and I have an unusual rotation where one random Sunday a month I preach there, and they never know when it's coming, so nobody can plan their attendance around it. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, I told him I was going to be coming, and Karen said, what do you want to preach about? I'm like, I don't know. I'm used to writing my messages to specific issues going on in a congregation, and unfortunately, I don't know you well enough to know what did each one of you face. So as I was praying about it, I realized, you know what? It doesn't matter what we're facing. Each of us need God's protection for something in our lives. So for whatever your challenge is this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit will encourage you and empower you today through this message. Throughout the scriptures, we read stories of God's protection, how he protected his chosen people in Israel, in the desert when they were fleeing the Egyptians, how he watched over them. We hear our stories of no matter how much they screwed up, God was still protecting them and trying to turn their hearts back to him. But see, it's not just in the Old Testament that he protected his people. He's done it throughout the entire scriptures. And in fact, in John, Jesus talks directly to the disciples about this. You can't tell this is my well loved one of all the groceries. As he was talking to his disciples and he was telling them about how they needed to follow the commands, he said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. This is my favorite part. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. But he continues on right after this, and he says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. But I have chosen you out of this world. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. They hated me without reason. As he wraps up that passage. Jesus knew the need of protection because he went through this firsthand. And he was warning all of us that we're going to go through these hard times, but that we need to keep ourselves in him and with him. See, God's protection is all around us, but sometimes we fail to see it. We fail to use it, or we fail to appreciate it. 
Stop and think for a moment. This morning, have you experienced God's protection? Maybe you're running late, which ironically I wrote that before I did. <laughs> Maybe you were running late and you saw a car run a red light just before you. And you should have been there at that moment, but you're running a few minutes behind. Maybe something wasn't even on your radar this morning that could have happened and didn't. I'd heard a story years ago of, and it's fictional, but of two angels that were traveling and, and they came to a rich man's house looking for a place to spend the night. And the rich man said, yeah, I guess you can stay in my basement. So that night, the angels went to make a place to sleep on the floor, and, and the senior angel walks over to the wall that has a big crack in the foundation, and he patches it. Now the younger angel looks at him like, what are you doing? But he didn't say anything. The next day, they continue their travels, and they end up at this run-down, decrepit little farm. And this elderly couple greets them at the door, and they ask for a place to stay. And the elderly couple says, absolutely, come on in. And they give them their room, and they say, you go ahead and sleep in our bed tonight. So that night, as the angels are going to bed, the angel of death shows up. And the older angel goes out to deal with it. The next morning, the only cow on the farm is gone and dead. And the younger angel goes, okay, I don't understand this. I just got to know. Why, when we went to Rich Man's house, who was a jerk and made us sleep in his basement, why did you fix his foundation? And then when we stayed these, with these people who were wonderful to us and gave us their own bed, you let their cow die. I don't understand. And the senior angel said, well, here's the thing. That crack in the wall is where the rich man stored all his treasure and no one knew it was there. And now he can't find it. <laughs> and the angel of death came that night to take the farmer's wife. And I talked to them to the cow instead. We don't always know the times God is looking out for us. We don't know the things that he prevents us from. And sometimes we get focused on the little things that we think aren't going right. But we all know that he's there and his word is promised that he loves us. So if he's protecting us, how can we see it? How can we know these things going on? Well, first and foremost, you need to be in a good relationship with God. You need to be reading your scriptures. You need to be praying. You need to be listening. I know for some of us who pick up the Bible, and it's like, okay, none of this is making sense to me. Then start with a devotional book. A sentence here, a paragraph there. Take it in pieces if you have to, but get into the Word daily. The closer you draw to God, the easier it's going to be to see Him and what He's doing around you. After all, don't you notice things you're looking for? When I was younger, I had, was told I had to get glasses. I was too young to deal with contacts. And I will tell you, at nine years old, I did not want to get glasses. Nobody else wore glasses. Why should I wear them? I'm going to look like Sherry. But it was amazing. That first day I wore glasses to school, I suddenly realized how many other students were wearing glasses. Uh -huh. Ones that I had never noticed. The same thing happens as adults. Have you ever noticed yellow cars in this town? Probably not. But I bet you today when you leave here and you go to lunch and you start looking for yellow cars, you're going to be amazed how many are here in this town. <laughs> you're going to start to see the things you're looking for. So when you're drawing closer to God and spending time with him, you're going to start to see him. And it's going to be like, oh, you've been here the whole time. And he's like, yeah, you were the one not paying attention, not me. <laughs> the second way we can start to see God's protection is by acknowledging that we can't do it all. And therefore, maybe we didn't do it all. See, the quickest way to stop being close to God is to think you don't need him. Or to think that you're capable of doing it all yourself, or that you have done it all yourself. Sometimes that's the downfall of self-made people. They forget that they still need God. I served a church years ago that had been able to hold it together financially for years. They had no endowments, no memorials, no times that they had to trust God. And it was amazing how little faith they had. Well, as that budget dwindled down and down and down, so did the congregation, down to 12 people. And I got sent there, and I said, guess what? We're going to remodel the parsonage. And they said, what? Because they had a for sale sign up. <laughs> and they said, but it needs like thirty or $40,000 worth of work. Mm -hmm. There's 12 of us. Mm -hmm. I said, 
Do you want to close the church or do you want to have a future? Do you want to step out on faith and see God show up? Or do you want to think you're doing it all yourself? The coolest thing was we didn't have any special memorial come in. We didn't have any special offerings that we asked for. But from February to May, they got all the remodeling done. And we're talking ripping out boiler systems and putting in HVAC. It was a 1920s house. But the coolest thing was at the end of May, the church's checking account was actually higher than before we started the project. Because they had to learn to trust God. They had to learn to rely on him and know that it wasn't enough. There was a story of a little boy who was trying to pick up a rock, and he said, Dad, it's too heavy. His dad said, son, you can do it. Pick it up. And the boy kept straining and trying, and he said, Dad, it's too heavy. But the father said, son, I know you can do it. And he tried again. Dad, it's too heavy. Son, you're not using all your strength. Dad, I am. I am. But it's a really heavy rock. Son, you're still not using all your strength. Dad, why are you continually telling me I'm not using all my strength? This is a really heavy rock. And the father said, I know you're not using all your strength because you haven't asked me to help you yet. See, there's more strength available to you than you have. But you have to be strong enough to ask. So, when we are dealing with challenges, what are the first steps that we need to tackle? Well, the first one is we need to figure out who the enemy really is. I've already read in scriptures, it is not flesh and blood. It is not the annoying person that's sitting next to you wherever you may be. Don't look at your neighbor. Right now. Um, <laughs> it is not the co-workers. It is not your spouse, okay? These are not our true enemies. Our true enemies is, as we know, the light and the darkness here, and the lack of light. <laughs> I don't even like acknowledging names. It's kind of like in Harry Potter where they won't name the one guy. I don't even want to do that. <laughs> but the reality is that it said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, and the powers of the dark world. The enemy has been described several ways throughout scriptures. In 1 Peter, he's referred to, he says, be controlled and alert. The enemy, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring, roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In Genesis, he's described as a serpent. And let me tell you, I absolutely hate snakes. <laughs> so I don't even love that word. You can ask my daughters, they think it's hilarious how much I hate snakes. I don't care if it's a little garter snake. It's not right, they don't have legs, they shouldn't be moving. So, <laughs> I don't know. But one of the things about snakes is they don't close their eyes. They're open 24-7. I think their eyes are kind of clear. Ms. Snyder might be able to clarify that one. <laughs> or my daughter definitely would tell me. It's because they're always looking. They're always alert. That's part of the reason the enemy uses a snake. That's an analogy for this. And see, he's not looking to hurt you just a little. It said he's looking to devour you. Now, we've seen devour versus a little. We've seen a teenage boy attack a pizza versus a young kid. <laughs> we know what devour means. <laughs> There's no trace left. <laughs> and in John, it says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. <laughs> Nothing left. So how can we use this protection? I showed it earlier to the kids. You know, the orange comes with it built in. And, and the first time I ever did that, I was shocked that the orange sank once I took the peel off. I didn't know the peel was what held it up. But it was. <laughs> well, as I read in scripture, the way we are to do it as followers of Christ is by putting on the armor of God. The full armor. Now, this is something I'm preaching on because I struggle with it personally. I have a uh, prayer warrior that's been working with me for years, and she was my partner. Oh, back before I even started ministry, and I would call Nancy up and I'd say, Nancy, this and this are going on, would you please pray for me? This woman has this amazing gift of prayer, something I didn't feel capable of. And every time she would ask me, now Christine, did you put on your armor this morning? No. <laughs> Can you just pray for me, please? <laughs> and one day she, uh, I'm going to state my age when you hear this one, but she put it in perspective. She goes, are you running around in your spiritual underwears? <laughs> it might not sound silly, but yeah, spiritually I was. <laughs> but put it on. The belt of truth. We know the power of the belt. It holds everything up where it's supposed to be, right? <laughs> but the truth holds everything together. The breastplate of righteousness. If we think of what armor 
was being described at this time. This would have been that big piece of metal that not only went over your front, but your back too. So it protected you from things you didn't see coming. Feet fitted with readiness through the gospel. That means you are ready at any moment. Scriptures tell us we should always be able to explain why we have our hope in Christ. We need to always be ready as followers. The shield of faith, which is supposed to be protecting us. Now, when we see armor and we see the videos, the shields are always kind of little. But the reality is Roman soldiers, their shields went from the floor to about here. So they could completely hide behind that shield. It meant that shield of faith was heavy, but it was big enough to hide behind their entire body. And hiding wasn't a coward thing, it was a self-preservation thing. You had a much better chance of surviving if you were behind the shield. Not because you were a wuss, but because you were smart enough to stand behind the shield. <laughs> the scripture continues on and says, The helmet of salvation. Have you noticed every dangerous job has a helmet? Construction workers? The military? Football players? <laughs> There's a reason that you have a helmet. You need to protect that. And the helmet of salvation is supposed to do that for us. And then the last part said the sword of the spirit. And this was the capital S spirit. For those of you who are grammar Nazis like my daughter is. Capital S means the spirit of God. Little s is not the good spirit. So when you see a capital S in scripture, that's the spirit of God. So the sword of the spirit. It's the word of God. And it's what Jesus fought with. Anytime we see him having conversations or altercations with the enemy, he always pulled out scripture. So how do we fight? Well, the first step is be on your knees, literally and figuratively. The scripture wrapped up saying that we should pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. So the first thing is you need to be alert. The enemy is a lot like some of our kids we've raised. When they learn a certain tactic doesn't work anymore, they try something new. <laughs> the enemy will do the same thing. So you always need to be aware of what's going on. The other thing is that there's going to be times that you're going to feel like your prayers are anemic, that they're just not effective. Have you ever had that moment where you say a prayer and you feel like it just bounced off the ceiling and didn't go anywhere? Well, that's not true. The enemy likes to let you think that. God hears all our prayers. Even when we don't have a word to say, he knows what's in our hearts. So pray for what's on your heart. Keep it simple. Don't worry about all the flowery words and the right liturgy and all that kind of stuff. Just say what's on your heart. Like you're talking to a friend. Jesus talked about this and he said in Matthew, when you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans. I love that. He said the rich don't babble. <laughs> For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Just keep it simple. God knows what you need. The best illustration I've ever heard, though, of this is let God fight for you. Stand behind him. Sometimes in our society, we think that if you're behind something, that makes you a coward. No. It means you're wise enough not to be vulnerable. We think we have to go and do the fighting. But it says, take our stand against the devil's schemes. It's more of one of these, hey, God, this guy's picking on me, and you stand back and let him do it. It's relying on him. It's like that young boy that couldn't lift the rock. It's asking his dad to help. For many of us, we're going to leave here today and follow our normal routines. We're going to go to lunch, and if I get done quick enough, you'll be my church over there. Um, <laughs> we're going to visit family. We're going to maybe go watch a sports game. But no matter how ordinary our day may be today, no matter how routine and mundane things get, God's always there. He's always guiding us. He's always protecting us. He's always loving us. But see, just like the armor, you have to go put it on. Just like the son who needed help, he had to ask. It's always there waiting for us. God wants to. But he's a gentleman. and He's going to wait on us to ask. So don't let his love and his protection sit in the corner collecting dust. Be active in your relationship with him. Talk to him, even if it's like you, people think you're nuts because you're talking to somebody right next to you that's not really there. It's okay. Don't take it for granted. This is an amazing gift we have through our relationship because of what Christ Jesus did. So embrace it and see what adventure God takes you on. Because when you're with him, 
It's going to be awesome.
Help us to speak more boldly of the mystery of the gospel. God of love and grace, hear our prayer. We can be ready for the world. Teach the leaders of this and every land to put aside all falsehood and corruption and to seek your ways of justice and peace. We can pray for this community that best this place to become your dwelling place, a safe shelter for strangers and refugees. Place of promise and peace for all. God of abundant grace, hear our prayer. We pray for love, Jesus. Speak tenderly to those who are hurting. Encourage them through your healing word, the word that brings the dead to life. Generous God, as you provide for us each day, nourish and strengthen us in faith and faithfulness so that we may share your grace in a hungry world. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of life, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now for our offering. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Trusting in divine care, let us present our tithes and offerings to God, who restores our lives eternally.
courage to step boldly out as a disciple of Christ. Have the courage to ask your Father for help when you need it. And walk in relationship with him. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.